we're in the home stretch before lunch, and I'll try to keep this very brief, because a lot of it's been touched on. It's probably not the best sequence uh, in terms of how to talk about this, because we've talked, we sort of had a lot of really good speakers talking about different aspects. So lots of disclosures, because our lab is heavily supported by industry. The study groups are supported by industry, so we're very fortunate to have industry care about what we do. So very quickly, here's a case that I did with my mentor, J.P. Farsia, um, who I trained with up at Columbia, and then I was in practice with him for um, a while. So this is a case um, when not a lot of people were doing three-column osteotomies 10 years ago. Um, that's about the time that I stopped really working with him and had, um, was doing most of my cases on my own, but we still did a few together. So this was, at that point, um, considered reasonable that we would lose four liters of blood and that it took us eight hours and you were in the ICU for a few days and that's just kind of um, considered normal for a complicated case. And then you fast forward to where we are now. So instead of two surgeons and four liters, we're down to one surgeon, but I have to say with really outstanding fellows here. Um, and blood loss has dramatically come down. Uh, our OR times come down. Many of our patients uh, don't go to the ICU. They may go to a monitor bed, but um, pretty quickly get out of bed. Um, and so a, a real shift in how we think about these complicated surgeries. And then, and then this is a third case to highlight not only we, uh, for similar cases are we a lot faster, more efficient, but we're actually pushing the envelope, and it's often not us. It's not that we're rectal surgeons, but the demand is really growing. I think patients feeling more comfortable about spine surgery, um, and as they get older, saying, I want to I wanna be able to uh, function better. So this patient now is 91. She came back for follow-up, um, and uh, she's very, very active, big social life, lives on her own, um, and uh, did a T4 to pelvis, lost a liter, um, she stayed for a few days because she's elderly and I think made us nervous, but um, she was the one demanding this, and this is something that we pretty regularly do now. So what's changed is a number of things, right? Uh, the deformities haven't changed, uh, the complexity hasn't changed, but the demand has really increased, and I think we've gotten a lot better at parsing out individual aspects, just like we heard Ellen talking about anesthesia and pain. Um, you know, we've gotten better at understanding radiographic uh, aspects. I think our blood management's gotten better. And we had a great talk by Roger and many others. Um, and I look forward to more talks on navigation and robotics. Um, so a lot of things got better um, and have really driven the field forward. And so just to touch on each of those. So alignment, we spent the last 20 years figuring out what, what does even deformity mean and what does alignment mean and, and what does it mean to get a patient well aligned. And now we've gotten much deeper in, in the last few years really getting to personalizing it. So it's great to understand the basics and have a framework. And now we're getting into really personalizing um, for an individual what it means to be well aligned. And also in what area of the spine do they need alignment, not just total degrees, but how do we distribute that? And that plays into where do you do an osteotomy, where do you do your correction? So we're getting hyper uh, targeted on a really patient specific care. We also gotten much more comfortable with the osteotomies that it takes to realign these patients. Um, and this is briefly some data from the ISSG showing that over a nine-year period, we've substantially improved our outcomes. So we're doing a lot more of these osteotomies, and we're doing them more safely uh, with better outcomes. Um, uh, some other things that have changed is instrumentation, and it's not necessarily that um, the screws have changed so much, um, but we have some different heads that help us a little bit for certain applications. We've learned um, that using multiple rods across um, areas of uh, a correction uh, seem to be important. We're starting to use custom rods that saves time in the OR and, and hits our alignment targets. We're starting to use tethers for, for junctional transition zones. Uh, we have better and, and more varied ways to attach to the pelvis. Our corrections are not only through bone, but also through disc and lateral approaches. Um, so a lot of things that are um, perhaps incremental and not, 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 not wow changes, but by the time you add all this up, like the small changes in anesthesia or in blood management, um, if you look at the 100 things that drive a successful spine surgery, if you improve 50 of those, that's a big deal. And they may seem like small changes, but they really add up. So on the imaging front, um, the fact that we have full body films has helped us better understand these patients. Um, and, and in addition, some of the MRI imaging, particularly other work Hollis Potter is doing here, some really great stuff on how we can better image and better understand the pathologies. Yeah, intraoperatively, we're using better imaging and getting much higher quality images with flat detector technology, getting bigger fields, um, and then being able to use that for multiplanar reconstructions and, and then to link that to our navigation systems. Um, I want to touch a little bit on blood loss because Ellen didn't have much time to talk about that, but obviously this is much more in Ellen's field. Um, uh, but, but we're learning that obviously blood loss is a major driver of complications, and there's also an opportunity for change because uh, there's so much variability between different sites. But overall, just the awareness and some of the blood salvage techniques uh, us doing our procedures faster, and also touch on a minute, the use of TXA um, has really markedly impacted 
uh, blood loss for these big surgeries. And I highlighted that with that early case, but that's such a, an important factor in the physiologic hit to the patient. And yes, you can retransfuse the patient, but it's never the same blood. Um, and they are physiologically very different patients by the time you take four or five liters out of them. Um, here are some of those uh, blood management strategies that we employ, and a big one is obviously TXA. We're still working out what those protocols are. Um, we slowly increase the dose. Um, in terms of loading dose, and Ellen and I argue a little bit over it, but I think we're slowly getting up to sort of 30, and 3 is kind of seems to be the sweet spot. Hopefully we can uh, move that up safely, but we'll have to see. Um, I won't talk about uh, the pain management and the anesthesia, uh, only to say that we have a really good chronic pain service, so all of our patients now are going to be seen by chronic pain, um, and they really optimize our patients pre -op, and it makes it so much easier to deal with them in the recovery room and afterwards um, if they've been optimized ahead of time. So, so that's all stuff that's affected complex spine surgery in the last 10 years um, and I think has really had a major, major impact uh, on getting our patients safely through surgery and I think has given them comfort and even referring physicians to say, you know what, you may be 70, maybe 80, but you, know, you can have a big surgery and have it safely and expect a really good outcome. Uh, even if you have some bumps along the road, we think we can do this safely uh, on our patients. But the next 10 years are going to be a challenge. They're going to be a challenge for a couple of reasons. One is the demand is going to grow dramatically. Uh, and the other problem is uh, that the cost is going to go up, but the supply of surgeons isn't growing. And so there's a big disconnect. As you see a shift in the aging population, but you look at the number of surgeons that can deliver care to those, um, and there's some projections here on what shortage is. If you look at just that last column on the right, there's going to be a shortage of about 5,000 orthopedic surgeons, and I think a number of those, a big number of those are going to be spine surgeons uh, for these aging patients. And it's very hard to produce more spine surgeons. It takes about uh, 20 years of training, most programs are not really growing the number of fellowships. In fact, we shrunk ours, um, and, and so that's going to be a problem. And what that means is that we're going to have to be able to do um, a lot more surgery safely, uh, faster, um, and with faster recovery uh, in order to address the need of that population. And so talking about cost, um, there, there are a number of cost drivers. Um, Rick Hostin has talked about it and done a lot of great work on this, obviously, and through the ISSG and the big drivers as we touched on earlier, are revisions and complications. Um, and that's where I think, um, as uh, Chris Ames has talked about, we do need AI to help drive our patient selection better and also drive our pathways and be able to address patients that are going in the wrong direction before we get to the point where we need to do a reoperation. Um, some of the other things that I think are going to uh, dramatically change in 10 years is our understanding of the patient. So the patient used to come in, you would talk to the patient for 5 or 10 or 20 minutes, they'd fill out maybe a questionnaire, uh, we'd look at an x-ray and from that kind of have to figure out what to do. And I think we talked about the imaging and how the imaging is uh, changing dramatically. I think MRI is going to give a lot more functional information on the soft tissues. I think we're going to engage patients much earlier on. And I really like Chris Ames' thought that we monitor our patients so that we see what trajectories they're on. It'll be much more valuable than just capturing one data point. And so I think a lot of these engagement tools to um, to, to, to figure out the trajectory of patients will be important. And then in terms of functional evaluation, Virgin has done a lot of work uh, assessing different functional tests and particularly um, also assessing muscle quality and muscle function um, and muscle mass or volume. And I think those will enhance really our understanding of the complexity of a patient. As Chris Ames pointed out, these are all little dots that are going to color a full um, a representation of our patients and be able to direct their care better. Um, we talked about AI, so I'm not going to talk more about that. Um, and I think one other uh, concept, and Virginia has touched on this, and I thought it was interesting because I hadn't even noticed it so much. She said, it just seems like people are more and more specialized, in particular a large center like this. We have plastic surgeons, we have really good pain management service, we have anesthesia, we have so many specialists, and maybe it's the era of hyper-specialization, and we have to accept that maybe that's going to be necessary to be able to drive higher volume with more predictable outcomes uh, for our patients. And that may mean that we have to also accept that Yes, AI and a lot of these tools are going to be directing or helping us direct better care, and we're going to have to have technologies that are going to make us more reproducible and hopefully also faster in the OR. I don't think they're faster yet, but that's okay. I think we're just learning how to integrate these enhancing technologies, but ultimately they were, they're going to have to make us faster in addition to making us more reliable. Um, and finally, a couple other concepts here on how we're going beyond fusions. There's a lot of work going on on tethers. Uh, muscle regeneration, disc regeneration, and that's probably going to change the landscape to a certain extent uh, as well. Um, and so in conclusion, I think dramatic improvements have happened in the last 10 years, and I have to say we as spine surgeons really benefit from this collaboration with all these other disciplines because I would say most of the improvements 
or at least a good portion of the improvements have happened outside of the surgical uh, specialty, but there are these incremental changes that by the time we add them up have really had a dramatic impact on what we can safely do in the OR and what outcomes uh, we can expect. And I would say uh, being honest with our data and getting large data sets has had a marked impact uh, on complications and outcomes. Um, and so I think the day is not far away when we're going to do a T10 to pelvis and the patient will go home two days. In fact, I was just mentioning to Ellen, we did a T10 pelvis recently, one of the fellows on the case, the patient had literally almost no pain and on the second day cleared physical therapy. And I think the day will come when that's going to be routine that we send patients home in one or two days. Thank you very much.